York's classic rock, Q1043. Well, it's an honor to have you. We have this morning with us here at Q104.3, Steve-O, who is Stephen Glover, who is a famous star and has been for decades since the uh, Jackass franchise began as a television series on uh, MTV and uh, continues on through what will soon be a fourth movie and uh, also a, a stand-up comedian and uh, an, an animal lover and soon to be an author. Wow. Well, th thank you very much. Actually, soon to be a second time author. I'm a bona fide New York Times bestseller already, and I am determined to get number one on the bestseller list with uh, this next one. Well, how on earth did I miss the first book? I used to go to Barnes and Noble uh, all the time. How did I miss it? Yeah, I don't know, man. It was number 18 on the nonfiction bestseller list for like one week. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, but that's, Hey, that's, that's top 20 for one week. That's something to be proud of. Do you have it? Do you have it framed from the New York times book review? Um, that I do not have, but the, the paperback copies all say New York times bestseller along the top, which, uh, which I really dig, but, um, Gosh, I wanted to say number one on my well, next book. Well, the, the the next book will be next year. What's it called and what's it about? Um, I I understand that the title we're going with is A Hard Kick in the Nuts. Um, <laughs> well, that's and, on the title alone. You're guaranteed to be number one. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, the, uh, the subtitle is... Um, uh, my the, what I learned from a lifetime of bad decisions or terrible <laughs> decisions or, or awful decisions. I'm not quite sure, but uh, but it's a book of wisdom. Well, it, <laughs> and, and well, you do have some wisdom to impart, no doubt. You know, that's the thing is that the book kind of started as a joke and it's a little bit funny, but uh boy, is there a lot of like real stuff in there. You'd be surprised. Even though my life isn't particularly relatable to a lot of people, like the, you know, the, the lessons learned actually are in a lot of cases. Well, after you dropped out or flunked out of the University of Miami, whatever it was, uh, you yeah. went to, and th this fascinates me because I've, I've heard so much about it. I mean, it, it's, it, it was really a world famous institution. You went to the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus Clown College. That was in Sarasota, right? Sarasota, Florida? Correct. Yeah, they uh, had it in multiple locations, but the, most of the time it was in Sarasota. And it's really famous. A lot of the world's great performers have come out of that school. I mean, what was, what was that, what was that like? I mean, I've heard about it. I've read about it, but I've never really sure. had a conversation with someone who's been there. Um, right. It, uh, it was really more like boot camp than college. Um, boot camp for clowns was what it was. And I think that what really made it most notable was, um, the uh, statistically, it was very difficult to get in. They they would hold auditions in like a hundred cities every year, and um, only like thirty clowns got in. I know. Well, that's so, why that's why it was fascinating to me because we're talking about a real high prestige place. You know, I mean, if you're a classical pianist, you want to get into Juilliard. You know, if you want to be a clown, there was no better place in this hemisphere than that particular well, clown college. Right. I, I'd go even further and say there is no place in the world, really. I mean, if you want to be a clown in Cirque du Soleil, they don't have a clown college for that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, um, so, yeah, it was a big deal. But at the same time, um, you know, the, the animal stuff really was a bummer. I remember being in clown college and there was one day, one portion of a day that they uh, allotted to have the, the public relations people from the actual Ringling Brothers Circus come in to speak to us. And they only really had one message, which was, uh, you know, some of you will be working on the, the circus and that will entail doing interviews. 
in advance of the circus coming to town. And during those interviews, people are going to ask you about uh, the animals in the circus and the treatment of them. And when that happens, you have no opinion. You shut up. You fall down. You're a clown. You, you, you know, it was just like, I, thought, I remember just thinking, wow, uh, you know, these people are here kind of uh, sort of putting up a red flag about what's going on. You know, well, and, although although that may have been difficult for you because you're you're also well known as as an animal lover, uh, but that aside, uh, the experience that you had there uh, as as a person who was studying a performing art must have been extraordinary. Well, it absolutely was, and. Um, you know, my story was, and by the way, I, I really appreciate you, um, you know, doing doing this research to, to learn about my past. Um, <clears throat> when I dropped out of the University of Miami, I was dead set on using a home video camera to become a crazy famous stuntman. And at the time in 1993, there really was no precedent for that. And everybody who I, uh, you know, proudly exclaimed this plan to they just felt sorry for me, you know, we're like, what a loser. And in fact, I was completely homeless for the first three years. And then, um, and then I found out about clown college and it just occurred to me that if I could get in there, then maybe I would get some traction in my efforts to become a stuntman because this would make me a trained circus professional and, and bring some kind of legitimacy to my efforts with my home video camera. So I'm probably the only guy who ever went to clown college seeking legitimacy. And, well, um, well, and and you have what, 24, 25 million followers now? I, I think it's more like 35 now, honestly. 35 but, um, million followers. Okay, so you have, so what you've learned to do as a performer has amassed this gigantic fan base. And And by the way, while we've been talking, I kind of, surreptitiously looked over at my computer screen here and did a little added research. And I apologize. I certainly should have known about professional idiot. Oh, hey, dude, come on, man. It's easy, dude. I'm not, I'm not worried one bit. And, because, uh, yes, it was a big New York Times bestseller. <laughs> number 18, baby, on the nonfiction list. Well, the, the bucket list tour is is your current uh, tour. You're going to be in our area on Monday at uh, Levity Live in Nyack in uh, oh, cool. beautiful Rockland County. And then on Tuesday, you're gonna be at the very famous uh, Stress Factory in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, this is this is an interesting part of your life, no doubt, traveling all over the country doing these one-nighters. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, I, I'm beside myself with uh, with how it's all come together. You know, when, when I started touring uh, as a stand-up comedian in 2010, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a blessing and a curse, a, a double-edged sword sort of being Steve-O, like trying to break into stand-up comedy because, you know, the blessing was that I have a built-in audience and the curse was that nobody really cared about giving me a shot at doing stand-up comedy and uh you know i persisted with it and and um I, you know i really cared about it and I, I worked hard enough at it to uh continue to make the rounds around the circuit and over the course of the last 11 years uh i've really found my voice with it you know i've kind of uh put in the work with the stand-up and my first two comedy specials were uh, you know long trips down memory lane with uh you know old stories and, and then my, my second one with old footage uh and, and you know edited into it to illustrate the stories and with this tour i just got kind of bummed on turning into a dude who won't shut up about how much he could bench press in high school you know like i was like dude i don't want to live in the past it's just embarrassing so i set about doing a bunch of really gnarly stunts um that I never would have been allowed to do on Jackass because uh, so many of them are flagrantly illegal and 
and like properly triple x-rated and um dude last night we had six people pass out cold at my show in syracuse i mean dude, i've got audience members dropping like flies because the footage that i'm screening in this show is so gnarly well you and, don't want to uh, kill your audience steve oh come on i i know i don't but i can't help you know there's there's legal waivers posted all over the venue saying you enter at your own risk i say hey guy you know my, my opening act is my tour manager who's terrified of public speaking so as a as a cruel prank i force him on stage for just five minutes so that he can bomb trying to tell jokes and uh and then do it when it's his, his important job which is warn the crowd that in most every city we go to we have full-grown men uh, pass out cold in the audience i mean they faint and then they wake up and then they're fine but in the moment it's rather alarming and um you know i make it my own thing to say what before the video start the show it, you know, we're, we're not kidding we really have people pass out so with everybody in this room as a witness are all here at our own risk because i cannot be responsible for pussies passing out and uh and jackass forever <laughs> will be in theaters they still do Jackass Forever will be in theaters on February 4th. So obviously that uh, film is all ready done and uh, ready to go. And uh, what can your fans look forward to considering the fact that you've already done everything that's like gross and disgusting and weird? I mean, how can anyone's imagination even come up with new stuff for, a, for another movie? I mean, how do you even do that? You, know, you would be surprised, man. Um, there were 10 years... Uh, then, then we were all, you know, we had a 10 year hiatus between Jackass 3 and Jackass 4. And over the course of those 10 years, everybody's wheels were turning. And uh, it became much less of a consideration about whether we had <clears throat> ideas to film. And the new problem was, are we uh, so old now that it's creepy to watch the footage of our new ideas? And um, that was that was a major elephant in the room and before they uh greenlit the movie they had to do a test shoot to uh to, to determine whether our new footage was going to be quote sweaty <laughs> <laughs> well. and, and uh you know and, and so they, they did that and um and and they, they determined that the footage was actually in fact not sweaty and Knoxville swears up and down that the older we get, the funnier it is. I am not so confident in that. So I've been kind of trying, trying to race for an imaginary finish line and get my last licks in and do my gnarliest stuff before it's too late. And that's well, what this bucket list tour is all about. Well, our friends can also uh, hear your weekly podcast, Steve-O's Wild Ride. You have a lot of famous stars that uh, appear on that. And, of course, I want to mention again, Monday in Nyack at Levity Live and Tuesday in New Brunswick at the Stress Factory. SteveO.com. Very easy. Very easy. You don't have to think a lot about getting onto that website and finding out all the information. And uh, before we depart, and I know you're in your tour bus right now as, yeah. as we're speaking. Um, I mentioned earlier your genuine you know, love for animals. And uh, you and your fiance, uh, what you have uh, dogs and and cats and and oh, there's and look and and goats that you rescued. Now, who is that? This is Wendy, and I found her in the streets of Peru. Um, this is a real special story, man. I, I found her in the streets of Peru and just fell in love with her. And I made this video of how I brought her home with me to America. And that video got more views than any video I have ever put on the internet. Well, Can you Wendy, imagine how that made me feel? Well, well, it, it actually <laughs> should make you feel good. It should make you feel well, right, good. But, you know, when, when, when you said what you said about how uh, as a performer, I've amassed, you know, this, this following and, and everything, and the, the words are very kind. I'm super grateful for them. But 
when it comes to uh, you know the, the bottom line of what I do, I, I truly consider myself an attention whore. You know, that's my job title. I uh, I am an attention whore, and um, the lengths that I've gone to for attention are quite ridiculous. And for rescuing a street dog in South America to have been the <laughs> the coup de gras. That, that's a tough one. But Wendy is beautiful. Yeah, no, what a her. what a what a beautiful oh, dog. Is. Yeah, she is, man. And uh, and uh, yeah, we we've got three goats at our home in the Hollywood Hills, and the neighbors are super bummed on us. And uh, we our our plan is to buy a big property and open up an animal sanctuary, which uh, which is really like such a motivating thing. I want to just be crushing it and earning and, and working and striving so that we can uh, comfortably you know live out our years just surrounded by all kinds of animals and and uh, it's fun man it's fun to have um, a goal that's bigger than myself you know like something to sort of focus my attention or energy on yeah well that, you can uh, you can you know you have these 35 million followers which means that you have access to a large number of people that that you can influence to do good things yeah um I, not I, too I not too not idea. too many not too many people have that kind of reach i mean you're a fortunate guy right Land, you know I, I know that you probably got to move on with your show but uh, let me tell you which video got the least views <laughs> okay are you ready um i uh during the pandemic was heartbroken for all the stories of food uh, food banks with lines for miles and everybody losing their job. And, and um, I went about uh, stealing a trick, which I learned from Tony Hawk, which was to take a particularly impressive photo, print out, uh, you know, a thousand or more eight by tens of the photo and sign them all by hand and then sell them, giving 100% of the proceeds to charity. Mm -hmm. And I did that four times. I did it once with Tony Hawk, where we took a photo together and we both signed it. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, during the year of 2020, I donated over $600,000 to charity. And I made a video said uh, it called how I donated over $600,000 to charity in 2020. And it was the least viewed video of it. Nobody cared. That was kind of a, you know, kind of a except and, except except that that's not entirely true because the people who benefited from the six hundred thousand well, dollars certainly appreciated it. Uh, uh, of course, and I, and I'm not you know I, I'm not in any way um, suggesting that it, that I don't feel good about it. And and actually the flaw in the plan was that I even made that video. You know, like. If you're making videos for the purpose of getting views, if you're donating to charity for the views or for the, you know, accolades or, you know, then, then you're, you're not doing it for the right reason. So I'm clear on that. And, uh, and absolutely, I'm determined to, to leave this world better than I found it. All right. Well, Steve-O, Stephen Glover, thank you for taking the time uh, from your tour bus to uh, check in with us via Zoom this morning here at Q104.3. Uh, and have fun in uh, Nyack and New Brunswick next week. I will. Thank you, Mr. Kerb. Uh, again, I genuinely appreciate the honor of being on your show, man. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. New York's Classic Rock, Q104.3.